Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We're talking about feeding on ashes. Now, as I was saying, there are some stories I want to share with you before we get started. Real good into the message. These are the stories that God brought to my mind. One story, help me, Lord. <laughs> One story is picture you're at a nightclub. This is real worldly images now. Picture you're at a nightclub or at a party, whatever scenario you want to paint. And you're looking at the catch action out there, whatever you guys call it, you know. In our day, it was catch action. This one looks fine. That one looks fine. That one looks debonair. For some of you men, this one looks like a brick house. That one's like a Coca-Cola bottle, whatever. Bottom line is you're checking out the catch action. Yeah. Now you're getting yourself all worked up. You spent half the night getting yourself all dressed, smelling good, looking good. You got it going on from head to toe, and you know it. And you go to the club with your little private agenda. You know what you're there for because you do not want to go to bed by yourself. Now, check out the scenario. This is not for saved folks. This is for folks, you know, we remember back in the day, we were not always saved. So some of us can relate to these stories. Some of you on YouTube will relate to it because some of you are still not saved. But it's okay. I want you to hear this. Because God wants to reach everybody, saved and unsaved alike. Not all saved folks are living a holy life. We know that. And not all unsaved folks are living a crazy life, but they need Christ. Either way, what I want you to see is how badly we need the Lord. Now listen. So here you are at this nightclub or this party, scoping the scenery out trying to see who's going to be your first uh, contact. And as you're checking them out, the night goes on, you're dancing half the night away, you're striking up conversations with this one, that one, the other one, and you make a connection. There's a love connection in the air, y'all. And now we got to plan out the rest of the night. Now, we go from, from all night breakfast, restaurant somewhere, gawking at each other's eyes, talking a bunch of nonsense. Then the next thing you do, you're exchanging phone numbers and then you're trying to figure out how to get the conversation around to not ending the night so early. And you sit there. And when you sit there, you both make an agreement that, you know, we're going to hook up tonight. So you hook up. And it may last two minutes and it's all over. And one of the partners is all worked up while the other one is done. Anticlimactic. All of that night wasted for two seconds of a disappointment or two minutes if you're lucky. So now picture that. Now let's move on. Now, one of you, let's say, loves to gamble. And you're, and you're pulling that one arm bandit. You're pulling. These are all anticlimactic scenarios. You're pulling that one arm bandit. And you hear the ding a ling a ling and the chi 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 and all the different noises, the bells, the whistles, the horns, the sirens, everything that goes with these, these, uh, these one arm bandits. Slot machine. That's what I'm trying to think of. So. Here you are, you're having fun, you got a pocket full of quarters, change, whatever. And you're whipping them. You're whipping them down and you're watching the things line up and you're hearing them down the road and somebody hit jackpot and you hear somebody on the other end. They got a pocket full of change or whatever. And you're steadily feeding the machine, feeding the machine. You're all excited, but you're not winning. You're not getting anything out of it. It's costing you. Then you run out of change. Now, you might look up on getting five quarters back or two quarters or one. 
So you get a few free games. But now all your money's gone. You're tired. You go back to the hotel room trying to dig up some more change and you realize you're not only tired, you're done. So you go to bed in disgust. Anticlimactic, looking for this big explosive ending only to be disappointed once again. Now you're at the fireworks. Picture this other scenario. You're at the fireworks and you're there. You're all excited. You paid for your little ticket and you're waiting to see the fireworks. You're eating your popcorn and drinking your soda and you're all excited. You're going to watch the show. Maybe you're at the Rose Bowl or whatever on the 4th of July. And something goes wrong with their mechanisms and you only get half the show. And right at the point where you get that grand finale, and you that boom, 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 and all of that, you don't get any of it. And now you're disgusted because you could have stayed home and watched some good fireworks on TV for free. So now you go home with your tail tucked between your legs and your head hung down. What, what I'm painting a picture of is how people spend their energy, their money, their time, scratching, digging, scratching, digging, in hot pursuit for that excited moment, in hot pursuit for satisfaction guarantee, for that hot pursuit. And you're looking for that moment in your life where everything is worth everything. And you wonder why it's not happening for you. You wonder what's it all about, Alfie. You're itching, but no matter how you scratch, you can't find that spot that satisfies the itch and gets rid of it. So you're scratching, but you're still itching. And you're scratching, and you're still itching. You can't find it. You it's weird. You just can't find that spot. Do you know that's the way life is? Life can be so, so unsatisfying. Life can be so disappointing. You start to get an attitude. You start to get bitter. You start to get disgusted with life. You want to throw in the towel and just say, forget it. Stop the world. I want to get off. This ain't worth it, baby. But you still keep looking, don't you? Pride keeps you moving forward. That little flesh keeps scratching and pulling at you, pulling at your desires, and you get these hankering yearnings. So what ends up happening? Let me share this story. Years ago, I'm only sharing these stories because this is what came to me when I was searching for this word. I used to, when I was unsaved, I stayed with a guy for about a year and a half. I wasn't in love with him, but it was convenient for both of us. And one day I made up my mind. It ain't going nowhere. I'm not in love with him. What am I staying here for? I'm ready to go home. So while he was in a drunken stupor, I would slip out the back, Jack, make a new plan, stand, and I was back home before he knew it. He wakes up the next day. He calls. We talk. I, I'm done. And he's trying to talk us back into this thing. But I was done. A month later, he drives by. He wants to impress me. Listen to what I'm saying. I'm, I'm building this point now. He tries to impress me and he shows me that he bought a car. Bought him a nice fancy car, luxury car. And I'm not impressed by cars. I never have been. I don't care if it's a hoopty as long as it runs. That's all that counts to me. And he was so disappointed because he thought that him getting that car was going to make me impressed. And me being impressed, I was going to say, oh, this, what am I doing cutting this guy loose? 
but I didn't. I I was done. So that f- fell through. So he drives off into the sunset and he didn't get his mission accomplished. I wasn't impressed. I wasn't wowed and awestruck by this accomplishment of his. You know, we don't realize how much energy we waste in our lives trying to appease, trying to placate, trying to satisfy, trying to fill these voids, void after void after void after void. We got holes in our souls coming and going. And we're trying to use all of these these trinkets to fill the holes in our souls. Baby, the only one that can satisfy is Jesus Christ. That's the only one. You know, the Bible talks a lot about vanity. And that's what we're talking about. Vanity. That's what dust in the wind is about. Vanity. Okay, Isaiah 44. Let's go to verse 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. Now listen to this. Listen to this before I go any further. This is what I want you to listen to. Do you realize that when you are parched, hot, dry, thirsty, there's nothing more satisfying than a glass of cold, refreshing water. It is so satisfying, so gratifying. It really quenches that thirst, doesn't it? But here's the thing about it. This is what a lot of us do in the world. We need approval. We need uh, acceptance. We need attention. We need our pride stroke. Whatever the case is, we have needs. So what the Lord talks about is the way we try to satisfy needs with imitations. And one of the things the Lord tells us to do is to drink water from our own cistern. You cannot be satisfied from broken cisterns. A cistern is like a well. And when you drink from a broken cistern, you're dealing with stagnant, dirty, nasty, contaminated water. Listen to this. And some of you are digging, scratching, searching, hunting, digging, scratching, searching, hunting for stagnant, nasty, contaminated water. Do you know what that water smells like? Walk by a sewer pipe. That's what it smells like. I couldn't even get it past my nose to get to my mouth that stinks so bad. And what happens with that stagnant water is you get larvae swimming in it from mosquitoes and all kind of insects and mess in there. And you have waste from the birds flying. You got all kind of mess in that thing. But this is what we do. We go to the broken cisterns. Why do we go to the broken cisterns? Because we don't realize how satisfying living water really is. And we've been living off of broken cisterns all of our life. And we don't realize how bad that thing stinks and how bad it is for us. And we wonder why we're sick half the time. And I'm not talking physically. I'm talking psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. We are sick. We are weak. We're given to the dictates of the flesh. 
so easily tempted, so easily moved in the wrong direction, so easily controlled by the flesh. Why? Because we're used to the broken cisterns. We can get to them much quicker than we can get to the living water. Getting to living water takes a lot more effort. And one of the things God showed me that makes us not hunt, dig, and scratch for him and his living water is that we're lazy and we don't want to go through the effort it takes. So we settle. Because that's what we do. And then when we find out we're not as satisfied as we thought we were going to be, we find out that the void is still there. We find out that dissatisfaction is guaranteed when you feed off of broken cisterns. And we wonder, well, now what do I do? I'm in a pickle now. Well, yeah, that's what happens. Some of you are emotional shoppers. You go to the clothing store. You go to the jewelry store. You can't pay your light bill, but you got to have those Nike shoes. You can't pay your water bill, but you got to have this that or the other because it satisfies you for the moment. Broken cisterns, pacifiers, trying to placate that yearning. I don't care how much money you spend. Like the man said in the song, dust in the wind, all your money won't another minute buy. But you're scratching and digging and scratching and digging for stuff. More, more, more. How do you like it? How do you like it? You're empty. That's the problem. Because you don't have the patience to press in. It takes work to press in to get to know God on a one-on-one -on -one basis. He doesn't come cheap. He requires effort. And that's the problem. Most of us, we get impatient. We get disgusted. We get frustrated. So we find something else to do. Let's turn on a good movie. The Lord ain't doing nothing for me now. I'm going to watch a movie. Guess what? The Lord might have just been able to poke his head through the veil right when you decided to turn on the movie. But you couldn't wait. Mm, mm, mm. All right, Lord, help me with this. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. I want you to go with me to that. I want you to hear this because this is where a lot of us have issues in our lives. We wonder why things don't pan out for us. We get frustrated when we see the rich get richer. Mm -hmm. We don't realize they have an end. God's got an end to their story and it ain't going to be pretty. And I'm not talking about all rich. Some of God's people are rich because they're blessed. I'm talking about the ones that got their riches through ill-gotten gains. Listen, verse six, for as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of a fool. This also is vanity. You know what? Some of you are quack quack and laughing and cracking and joking, and you're just as miserable as you can be. But you'd rather sit around, talk about nothing with a bunch of folks that ain't about nothing because that is easier for you to do than breaking through the veil to get to know God for yourself. God is just too much work, baby. And you ain't got the time or the patience. 
So you sit around with a bunch of knuckleheads, laughing and quack-quan about nothing, talking loud, saying nothing, being about nothing, getting nowhere, just joking around, playing your life away. Because broken cisterns are easier to get to. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. Okay, surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, verse 7. And a gift destroyeth the heart. It's like a bribe. Like you try to buy folks. And then when folks try to buy you, you know, you put a whole different spin on it. You don't realize what's really going on. Verse 8, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud spirit. 9. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. This is a weird message because it's complicated. It's, it's complex. It's, it's intricate. And a lot of things we don't really deal with in life because we got all these little pacifiers and we placate ourselves with a bunch of nothingness in order to kill the boredom in order to camouflage the feeling of emptiness and the turmoil. Silence the turmoil. I don't want to deal with me. So let's let's just play. Let's eat, drink, and be merry. Oh, you ain't being merry because you're not happy. You're not happy because you don't have the joy of the Lord. But you're ready to at least fake it. Let's just play at it. It's like kids playhouse. That's what y'all are doing. You playing. And you're playing it because you don't want to take what it takes. You don't want to press in. You don't want to do what it takes. You don't want to obey till it hurts. Do you realize that a lot of pressing in and getting to know God comes through sacrificial effort? But if you are on the lazy side, it ain't going to happen. Because you're not going to let it. Because you don't have the patience. See, many of you get frustrated because you have yet to experience God one-on-one. -on -one. And some of the reasons you have yet to experience God to that degree, that supernatural degree, I'm not talking about the gifts. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you and God. Is because you don't want to take the time or the effort. Let me tell you, one time this this young lady and I we were sitting in the in the car. We had just come out of church. We were going to church five and six nights a week cuz they have renewal services at Harvest Rock Church in Pasadena. I knew I needed some healing, y'all. I knew I needed some some putting together from all the damage that came from a an adulterous marriage, aggravated adultery. Okay. So here I was feeling unattractive and undesirable all those years because X preferred prostitutes rather than me at any given moment. So I was left hanging high and dry. And finally, when I turned to the Lord and gave it all up, it stopped hurting me. That was a miracle right then and there. It stopped hurting me. It stopped being my problem. But there was one area that I hadn't covered in prayer. And that was my need for a man's attention. So I had to really fight through that. I had to navigate through that mess that I was left in. And God let me know, you are poor and needy. And I want to handle that. I want to fill those damaged holes in your soul. So we were at church five, six nights a week. I'm getting healing every chance I get, y'all. I'm getting prayer every chance I get. Tired from working all day, but I'm at church all night. Sometimes till one in the morning before we leave that church. And this chick and I were sitting in the car because we didn't want to leave the presence of God. We could feel it. It was still all over us. She could feel it. I could feel it. And we were sitting there 
and we would wait in silence, not saying a word to each other, waiting on the presence of God to manifest and speak to us. And we were experiencing God together. Most of the folks were gone. We were like maybe one or two cars in the parking lot. But we didn't want to let go. And God responds to hunger like that. <laughs> See, there's so much to God and his beauty. Oh my goodness. There, there is an element to his love that nothing on this planet can even imitate. It can't touch it. When God satisfies you, when God gives you peace, let me tell you, y'all, you are alive and well. It is worth every effort. It is worth every moment of obedience. It is worth every time you have to cry and force yourself to obey him when your flesh is crying out, no, it's worth it. When you get to experience God, There are so many dissatisfied Christians because of impatience, because of pride, because we don't want to take the time and work our way through. We don't want to do it. So we do without and we fake it. We talk a good game. We read a good game. We'll test the lie while we're testifying. We test the lying half the time. And if God walked up and pinched your nose, you wouldn't know it was him. Because you can't feel him. Why can't you feel him? You never experienced him. You got the gifts going. You got the Holy Ghost moving all through. But have you been touched by God? Do you want it that badly? Ah. Oh. Ooh, okay. Isaiah 61 and then we're going to we're going to close cuz this message right here can go on and on and on and on and on and we can be here till the break of dawn. No, we ain't going there. Isaiah 61. <laughs> I'm being silly. Okay, I want you to hear what Jesus says from verse 1 to verse 4. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. This is Jesus. Think of now, this is what Jesus read in Luke chapter 4 when he announced his ministry. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the broken hearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, we're just going to stop at three, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Listen, when Jesus came, he didn't only come to die. He came to preach good tidings, to bind up the brokenhearted. How many of you have been brokenhearted? How many of you have been broken by life, broken down? To proclaim liberty to the captives. How many of you are bound and, and, and locked in your own little self-made prisons? And the opening of the prison to them that are bound. How many of you are bound by habits to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord? You know, what you don't realize 
God came to heal. He didn't just come to heal your body. He came to heal you mind, body, soul, emotions, psyche, everything about you. He came to heal you. The potter wants to put you back together again. So, verse 4, and they shall build the old wastes. So the waste is not wasted. It gets rebuilt, refurbished. They shall raise up the former desolations. And they shall repair, 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 repair. Waste cities, the desolations of many generations. Some of y'all are bound with generational curses. And you don't realize that God is there to rebuild. But you don't take the time to know him. You don't take the time to decipher his word and get to know what's in store for you because you're so used to broken cisterns. You're so used to letting that flesh dictate your every action, dictate your every mood, your every motive, your every desire. You're so used to letting your flesh dictate everything in your life that you ain't got the time. It's just too much work. So you're, you're comfortable. You think you're comfortable with placating yourself. Just like the dope addict that sits up there and gets high off of heroin. Like somebody smoking weed all day, drinking so he's so numb. He doesn't feel anything. But guess what? That's temporary because as soon as that alcohol wears off, the pain rises right back to the surface because it hasn't gone anywhere. But once God heals a wound, it's gone for good. Then he heals another wound and he goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. But no, you don't have the time. You'd rather have playtime because you don't want to take the effort. You don't want to pay the price. You don't want to go through what you know you're going to have to go through in order to get free. See, you don't know what it's like to be free. So it ain't worth it to you. Because you don't even know if it's ever going to happen for you. Because you don't know if you really want to take the time to find out. I ask you. Come back to the Lord. Let him become your first love. Let him be number one on your totem pole, number one in your list of priorities. Get to know him in the beauty of holiness. Get to know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering. Cause you're gonna go through stuff, but what you will see in the fellowship of his suffering is that no matter what you have to go through in this life, he is a buffer, he's a painkiller, he's a healer, he's a deliverer. Many are the trials of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. I ask you now, for those of you who know that you got one foot in the church and the other foot on a banana peel, ask God to pull you all the way in, to show you where the real living water is, to give you such a hunger and thirst for it that you won't settle for broken cisterns anymore. Ask God to heal your soul. Ask God to remove the laziness. Ask God to remove your pride. You got to mortify the deeds of the flesh. You don't just pamper them and say, well, God understands I'm wounded. No. You slap yourself silly in the spirit. Get your head screwed on right. And for those of you who have walked away from the Lord, or those of you who have never known the Lord, 
I'm going to pray this prayer, and I want you to agree with me in prayer. Father, I don't know you. Don't know if I really want to know you that much. Kind of scared to take the leap. Because I've had so many people disappoint me, I don't know if you're going to come through for me. But I have nowhere else to turn. So I ask you to forgive me. Give me a clean slate, a new start, a new beginning. And I want to know you. I really want to know you. It ain't about not going to hell or getting into heaven. I want to know you in the here and now. Let that take care of itself down the road as you teach me and remake me and put me back together again. But for right now, I'm asking you for mercy and I'm asking to accept the Lord Jesus into my heart. And I'm not all that clear on him either. But accept me on my level of belief, even though my faith might be real small. Accept me there. And help me understand what he really represents in my life. Help me understand who you are in my life as my Father in heaven. In the name of Jesus, fill me with your Holy Spirit and take me on a whole new journey. Show me who I really am and show me what my potential really is. In spite of all the naysayers I've had to swim through all my life, I'm asking you to show me who you created me to be, purpose and all, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And for those of you who already belong to the Lord, but your diaper's messy, Pray this, Father, please deliver me from me. Help me, Lord. Heal me, Lord. Hold me. Don't let me go no matter what. If you got to take me early, don't let me miss out on you. Have mercy on me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.